Good afternoon. This is Martha Nowak with Kansas State University in Olathe. I'm pleased to have uh, a guest lecturer here to address you and inform you about uh, horses and their conditions with asthma and do they have inhalers? So she'll let us know all about it. Um, I did want to introduce uh, Dr. Rush. She is a Hodes Family Dean Professor of Equine internal medicine and um, has had professional training at, uh, at, she got her DVM at Ohio State University, she had an internship at North Carolina State University, residency at Ohio State University, and master's of science at the Ohio State University. She has uh, numerous uh, topics of research, um, which I'm sure she will um, elaborate on when she addresses us, but uh, we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Rush uh, here, and um, please keep your cameras on if possible. Um, she would like to address an audience because we are in Zoom. It's um, no fun to just look at names. <laughs> We'd like to see the expression uh, because she is a professor. She's used to seeing student expressions to see how to change things up a little bit. Um, so. Please uh, welcome Dr. Rush, and I will let you go ahead, Dr. Rush, and let you sure. introduce yourself. Sure. So I think Martha needs to at least see your faces so she can confirm attendance. So if you can turn your screens on. For me, I, I'm used to not necessarily seeing faces, but I would like your, um, I would like your, um, I'd like to hear from you occasionally. So I'm gonna ask some questions and you can either type your answers in the chat or you can um, unmute yourself and, and answer the question. So there's a, there is some audience participation and uh, we'd, sure like, we'd sure like to do that. I see a few familiar faces. <laughs> okay, I don't see everybody. So if we're going to be able to document who was here, please, please, at some point during this talk, show us your face. I don't need to see it for the whole time, though. Okay, let's talk about horses and disease. Okay, here we go. So I, I'm the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I came to Kansas State in 1993. Um, and uh, I've been here ever since. And so I was a faculty member. I am a specialist in horses and um, I saw horses uh, through the clinic for 15 years and then I became an administrator and um, I saw a lot of cases. My area of research expertise was, um, was allergic airway disease in horses and poor immunity in horses. Uh, so immunostimulants, and aerosolized drugs. And so we'll look at some uh, examples of, of horses with, with difficulty. So this is part of the audience participation. Um, tell me what you see going on with this particular horse. I can do this all day. We need a response from somebody. We need some talkers. Just shout it out, guys. Shout it out. Anybody see anything wrong with this horse? I can't. Oh, chat. There's something in the chat. Yes, labored breathing. Thank you, Courtney. Here I did say. Put it in the chat and then I couldn't see the chat. I see it now, thank you. Yes, this horse is breathing really hard and you would think this horse just ran a race, right? And is that would be a normal amount of breathing for a horse that ran a race. But this horse breathes as hard periodically. And you can see that the muscles here are actually bigger than they should be. It's like a, it's like a six pack this horse has from working so hard to breathe. And so, um, we, there's a disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in horses, and we didn't really like that name because that name, you've heard on TV, the commercials for COPD, right? It's a new day, you've got, you know, 
bronchodilators, COPD. Well, that really is a disease that's, that is triggered by smoking or secondhand smoke and in older people. So this is a disease that we see in younger and middle-aged horses, obviously not smokers, and it comes and goes depending on something that they're allergic to. And they're not all allergic to the same thing, but it does come and go. And in horses, we call this heaves. And if this was a person, if this was a teenager, what would we call this disease? What is this disease most similar to in people? You can use the chat or you can unmute yourself. Asthma. Asthma, right? So this looks like asthma. It, it really doesn't look anything like the COPD commercials you see on TV. It is more like asthma. So the horses are likely to be more likely to be female over seven years of age, thoroughbreds particularly predisposed. There isn't any, any um, breed of horse that doesn't get this, but it's pretty unusual in miniature horses. We, we haven't seen very many miniature horses with this disease, but quarter horses, um, Appaloosas, thoroughbreds, sure. And it's most likely to happen in winter and spring. So half of the respiratory diseases that go to a veterinarian are this. So there's lots of other things that could go wrong, right? You could get pneumonia, you could have a traumatic lung injury, you could break a rib and puncture a lung, all sorts of things can go wrong. You could be bleeding into your lungs. Half of the things that go wrong with horses' lungs are this, allergic airway disease. Uh, and so we, we know that it's somewhat heritable, but it's not really like blue eyes and brown hair. It's, it's a, more complicated than that. So if you, if you breed two horses that have heaves together, um, about 44% of, the, of their offspring will have it. Um, but 10% of horses that are bred to unaffected parents will also have it. So what we know is it's their smaller airways that get inflamed and, they, and their airways will constrict, bronchoconstriction. And these horses have trouble pushing air out of their lower airway. And that's a little bit different than asthma in that you've heard people with asthma who, who make a noise when they breathe in, right? And they have trouble breathing in as well as breathing out. Horses have more trouble pushing that air out. And here's why. Here's a normal airway. And if we add constriction to it and mucus on top of it, then you have a lot of trouble getting air to go through. And so in this case, here's a microscopic view of a lung where the airway is constricted and it's filled with mucus. So when you breathe in, you can get enough air in, but then when you try to breathe out and the lung collapses a little bit, that small airway collapses and you can't get air out. The inflammation that we see is different than humans and surprisingly cats also get asthma. So cats and humans, their asthma is way more similar to each other than horses. And this is why, because cats, the, the inflammatory cell type and in people, they say it on some commercials. So maybe, you know, do you know what type of cells are involved? They talk about a particular cell type on some of the commercials about human asthma, that it'll reduce your number of blank cell counts. Does anybody remember what that is? Now, you'll, you should listen, to, listen for it on some of the commercials. They'll say, this will drop your eosinophil count. If eosinophils are part of your problem, it'll drop the eosin, in an eosinophil cell count. So listen for that on commercials, because that's important. Humans and cats get eosinophilic inflammation. In horses, it's a different cell type, it's neutrophils. And that's, that's a surprise with an allergy, because when you get pneumonia, it's neutrophils. When you get an abscess, it's neutrophils. So those are really typical infectious cells that are seen in infections, right? Not allergy. Eosinophil is the cell of allergy. And I'll show you some examples. So horses are allergic to mold and they're allergic to the molds that are in hay and straw. And so if you have a horse that has this disease, it, it really means, it, you might be feeding really, really moldy hay by accident, right? And the horse triggers an episode. And if you fed really clean hay, 
maybe it wouldn't happen. But there are, there are horses that are sensitive enough. It doesn't matter what kind of hay you feed them. There's enough mold in regular hay to trigger an episode. And there's enough mold in most straw to trigger an episode. So I want you to listen carefully to this horse. And I want you to think about whether you're hearing a different sound, whether the horse is inhaling or exhaling. So listen carefully. Oop, let me play it again. Did you did you notice a difference between which which of those sounds, inhalation or exhalation, was more musical? Do you remember? You want to listen again and try to answer that question. Okay, what'd you think? Where was it more musical sounding? Was it the exhalation? Exhalation, that's right. Bridget, I think that was you, right? Yeah, it was on exhalation that it was more musical. And so that's a very classic sound with heaves is they talk about cooing doves. It sounds like cooing doves, but they're ha he this horse is having a lot more trouble pushing air out of its lower airway than it is getting air in. Although this horse is having a little trouble on both phases, right? The reason I like this video so much is um, do you notice anything else about the horse that seems a little bit off besides the way it's breathing? Just looking at the horse, the, just a picture of the horse, what would you say? So the horse, the eyes look a little funny, right? Everybody agree with that? And this horse um, looks thin. Does the horse look thin to you? Yeah. So we used to think that horses got dehydrated and we used to think that they got thin because they were breathing so hard they didn't take time to eat or drink. It was hard for them to take time for that. That's probably a little bit true, but what's more important is they're breathing so hard that it doubles their caloric needs in a day. And that's why they get so thin, is they're spending twice as many calories as a normal horse just trying to breathe. And they're also, when you breathe, you're losing a lot of uh, fluid through your exhaled air has, a t is, has high humidity, lots of water in the air that you exhale. So they're getting dehydrated because they're breathing so hard. And those, those are two things that happen and are important as you're treating horses that have heaves is they're not probably taking in enough calories and they're not getting enough fluids and you'll need to supplement them to get that to happen. So this is the other place. Um, okay, so Rachel says that her audio is not very clear. Is anybody else having trouble with the audio? Yes. Okay, let me just try to turn it up a little more. Although this audio is not important, so we'll turn it off. Are you having trouble hearing me or the videos? Oh, you can't hear the videos. Okay. Here's an idea, Dr. Rush. Uh, before you share the screen, or you can unshare the screen, and you should see uh, on the selection of, there should be two boxes at the bottom that say, maximize audio and video, you check those boxes and then share, it might help. I'm not sure I have any more videos that have sound. So I think okay. we'll keep going and just this horse, I just want you to look at those nostrils. That's a really important thing is the way they flare. And so if a horse had an obstruction in its upper airway, you would expect there to be, you can put your hands right here and this horse looks like it's moving a bunch of air if you put your hands right in front of the nostrils, but this horse is moving almost no air. Sometimes when the obstructions in the upper airway, you can feel air moving out of one side, but not the other. And that tells you 
the problem is not in the lungs, right? But it, when it's like this and you put your hands there and you don't feel much air moving, that's a really important thing to note that they're, that they're having trouble. Okay, this is a horse that is less severely affected, but still suffering from a lower airway problem. And what I want you to look at is that this horse is pushing pretty hard to get air out of the lower airway. So this horse is not gonna breathe hard at rest, but what would happen if you tacked this horse up and tried to, to work with it? What, what would, how would this horse react to exercise with you on its back, right? Not very well. It's gonna start coughing. It's gonna start to have trouble breathing. It's not gonna be able to perform. So while this horse doesn't suffer at rest, this horse is not gonna be able to be an athlete for you. And so getting this under control so the horse can return to its athletic ability is, is really important. Okay, can everybody see that or you wanna watch one more time? And I want you to look right here, how hard that horse is pushing on, the, on exhalation. Not working very hard on inhalation, but pushing pretty hard on exhalation. And that's a higher respiratory rate than you would expect for a horse who's at rest, just standing there. Okay. So we like to sample some of the mucus that's in the lower airway for horses that have respiratory disease of some sort. And what we would love the cells to look like in a normal horse is there's really just two types of cells that you would normally find. And these are macrophages and these are lymphocytes. And you can see how quiet they look. They don't look very angry. They look like there's not a lot of mucus there. That's a beautiful, normal horse. So this is the same view from a horse that has heaves. And these little things that look like, uh, some people describe them like Chinese letters. Um, these are those inflammatory cells in a horse. Normally, you would not see any of those, but in a horse with heaves, it's gonna be 70 or 80% of the cells. And here's one of those normal cells you'd be looking for, and there's another one, but you shouldn't see all this extra stuff. And you also see this kind of bluish purple stuff, that is the extra mucus that you're gonna see. And so this is another case where you'll even see this little spiraling thing that looks like it came out of a small airway. It looked like it's a complete internal, a complete cast of a small airway. And that's called a Kirschman spiral. And that means if you see those, then you know it's heaves. It's pathognomonic. That's a word that means 100% identifies one disease. So we don't have a lot of things in veterinary medicine that we would call pathognomonic, but when you see them, it's indisputable. That's what's wrong with a horse. And that's what these little curly things are. They're called Kirschman's spirals. So sometimes when you scope their trachea, we're in the trachea with an endoscope here, there's a ton of mucus. Horses are huge mucus producers when they have allergic airway disease. Cats have what I would call kind of dry asthma and humans have pretty dry asthma too. They'll cough up a little bit of mucus, but horses make lots and lots of mucus, which gets in the way of breathing. So how do we get these samples from the airway? Well, we can either do a tracheal wash, which means we're going to pop a little trocar right from the skin into the horse's trachea. And we're going to put some fluid in and we're going to pull it back out. We do this mostly with pneumonia. So we're looking for what bacteria is growing in the lower airway and we don't want any contamination from the upper airway. And that is what we're really looking for. When the next time you see a horse, I want you to feel their neck and look at the junction between the upper third and the lower two thirds of the neck and feel, you can feel their trachea right there. And so if you're gonna do one of these, you're gonna, you'll be able to pop a little trocar directly into that trachea and feed that tubing down, put some fluid in and pull it out. And we do it in a standing horse with just light sedation, hardly any at all. They don't really object to this procedure. It's a very simple procedure. It seems pretty invasive, but it really isn't. Um, the other thing that we can do at that little spot, maybe you've seen a person with a tracheotomy who's breathing through a hole in their neck before. That's the same place we would do a tracheotomy in a horse as well. If a horse was 
unable to, had an upper airway obstruction and we needed to create an airway, we'd cut right down to their trachea right there. So next time you see a horse, I want you to palp, just have a feel right there about how close the trachea is and how easily accessible it is. The other thing that we can do is a bronchoalveolar lavage. We're gonna take this very long tube and we're going in through the nose and down to the trachea and we're gonna go, 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 go until it stops and it wedges in a small airway. We're gonna put some fluid in and we're gonna pull it back out. And that's the procedure that we do most when we're gonna look at lower airway allergic disease. It's not very safe to do in a horse who's breathing hard at rest, but for what that mildly affected horse that we saw, um, it's, a, it's a reasonable way to go. And so I'm gonna just stop for a minute and ask if there are any questions. We've covered quite a bit. So anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? I'll ask, um, what type of research has been done with horses that have gone on into research for humans? I'm looking for that translational piece. Ah, interesting. Well, it mostly has gone the other way um, because horses are not a great model of disease because the cell types are different. People have any eosinophils, horses have neutrophils. So it doesn't translate that well. So what happens is we take, what are you using in asthma? Let's see if that works in horses. And many, uh, many times it doesn't because it's a different inflammatory cell, right? But there has been some work in cats. Cats have been a nice model for human medicine um, because of the cell type. And that's been important for some of the drug development for cats. Uh, or for humans that are targeting those eosinophilic cells. And we'll look at some of those cells very quick, pretty soon. So we see some horses who have a different type of allergic airway disease. These are usually very young race horses and they develop, there, there are four types of allergic reactions and there's type one, type two, type three, type four. Type one means an immediate reaction. So this is if you have um, so like a bee sting is a type one hypersensitivity. As soon as you get stung, you're starting to have any of you or a peanut allergy, any, anybody who has a peanut allergy or any other sort of food allergy that's immediate, shellfish maybe, and bee allergies, that's type one. And it's this type of cell. These are called mast cells. They're huge and they have these little tiny granules in them and they are angry. They leave all sorts of bad bad things in their wake. And so horses that have this, it's usually they've had the flu, they've had some other respiratory disease, and now, um, and now they, uh, they have this, um, now they have this inflammatory cell type. This doesn't last very long. It doesn't last forever. These horses get over this and we treat them differently than horses that have heaves. Uh, Ethan asked, do dogs get asthma? Not very often. Dogs rarely, rarely get asthma. Um, sometimes they'll get um, an allergic bronchitis, sometimes, but it's way less common than cats or people. Guinea pigs get asthma. Uh, that's another, another species that gets a fair amount of asthma. So we've been talking about those eosinophils and it's my favorite cell type because they're so pretty. They, these little raspberry looking cells are eosinophils. And you can see how different they are from all the other cell types that we looked at. And so eosinophils are really important in, um, par in parasitic diseases. So horses that have parasites, people that have parasites will get eosinophils, but they're also important for horses that have uh, allergic diseases or for cats and people who have allergic diseases. So if you've got asthma, you've got a bunch of these eosinophils in your airway um, and it's not great, right? It's, it's really hard. So the, the, the drugs that, um, that work best in people target this cell type, these eosinophils. So occasionally you'll do one of those airway washings and you'll find one of these guys. 
So it, you know, could it be one of those Kirschman spirals? No, it's got a little bit, it's got a cell wall. It's a little too organized for that. What do you think that could be? Anybody have any idea what that might be? Is it maybe a parasite? It's a parasite, Lily, thank you. This is a lungworm and horses get lungworms. Lots of, lots of species get lungworms. They don't all come from the same place, but in horses, they come from the same place, they come from donkeys. So sometimes you'll see a herd of horses that have this sudden outbreak of what looks like heaves. So, you know, the owner will call you and say, I've got a herd outbreak of heaves. Everybody has heaves. Well, is there a donkey in your pasture? Yeah, okay, that's easy. It's lungworms. And so if you just deworm them, they'll be fine. And almost any dewormer will work. So that's kind of a fun disease because the horses look terrible and you treat them and they get better and, it's, and you've completely resolved the problem and they know how to, you can resolve it in the future. So, yep, that's a Dictyocolis arnfeldi is the name of that parasite. So here we are looking at uh, the airway of a horse. So we're at the end of the trachea and we're just at the bifurcation of the, uh, of the left and right lung here. And that's called the carina. That's an important landmark in lungs right there is where things start to branch off and that we're at that branch point. And I just show you this to show you there's a lot of mucus, the airway looks really red and angry and it's not a very comfortable thing. As hard as you saw that horse breathing, what's interesting is the x-rays of the lung are not very interesting. So in this case, this x-ray, this is the horse's diaphragm, this is his vertebrae and these are major blood vessels going through the lungs and if you look really closely, like there's a little cluster of small donuts here, that's about all you're gonna see. And here's a little donut here and maybe a donut here. And here's the diaphragm, the heart is here, big vessels coming out of the heart, but it's not very dramatic. And the only reason to take x-rays of a horse's lung when you suspect heaves is if you've treated them and they're not getting better. And maybe it's something else. Maybe it's pulmonary fibrosis. Maybe it's some unusual um, pneumonia, um, viral pneumonia. It, it could be something else, but um, probably not. So what do we do for them, right? We said that they, that they um, are allergic to hay mostly, right? And so, um, Here's a sort of a nice highlighted picture of a horse eating hay from a hanging um, hay net here. And you can see that the horse is pulling the hay out and tons of dust is flying around and that horse is inhaling that. So if we were gonna remove or reduce the amount of dust that the horse is exposed to, we're definitely going to not feed the hay from above where the horse is pulling the hay out and letting it spread everywhere. We're gonna feed the horse on the ground and let them eat on the ground. Um, some horses, that's enough of a change that it turns them around. If every horse lived here, we wouldn't see any horses with heaps. If they could be outside green pa pasture, not a lot of mold out there, we would not see heaves. So these four horses, I had a herd of horses with heaves and uh, I had about 15 horses in my herd. They all had the disease and then I could put them outside and they'd be great. And then I could bring them in and feed them hay, induce the disease and then test various drugs to see if they worked or not, uh, to see what it would, what's the right dose, what's the right interval, how long can we treat them and still have them do, do well. Um, so they need to be outside. Um, and so the other danger, this horse, if you can see that horse right there, that was my patient. This horse has heaves. And I saw the horse in the clinic and I said, put the horse out on pasture, which they did, but I didn't give enough instructions, right? So this horse lives on my road and I'm driving home and there this horse is eating its way through the middle of a round bale. 
Well, round bales are absolutely full of, fun of fungal hyphae and they are dirty, dirty, dirty in the middle. And horses, unlike cattle who eat around the outside, horses eat a hole into the middle of the hay of, of it. And there's no way to get more allergen than if you gave a horse a round bale. You can see this horse even is eating into that hole right there. And so the other take home message is don't play with round bales. Don't let your, when you have kids, don't let them play with round bales because it's a ton of allergens in a round bale. Spend as, list, as little time as you can. The other thing that's a problem for horses is when they store hay up in the loft above a horse's stall, that creates a problem for the horse. And maybe you've seen some indoor arenas where a horse is living in an indoor arena and um, the horse's stall is right up against the indoor arena. That's a lot of dust for that horse to take in. So those are simple things you can do to change where the horse is living. If they live indoors, don't store hay over overhead. Don't have them where the indoor arena is. Um, and I really like, this is a, a quote from a, from a book from 1903. And what they're saying that heaves was caused by, because they didn't really understand it was an allergy, they said it was too much pressure on the horse's diaphragm because there was too much food in the horse's stomach because you were feeding hay, which took up too much space, but grass is more digestible. And so if you turn them out to grass, they'll digest more quickly and they will not have heaves anymore. So they knew what to do. They knew the right answer but for the wrong reasons. And I often ask myself, what, what, 100 years from now, what will they say about us? We made some decisions. We thought it was because of this. Well, it worked out for us, but it was the wrong reason entirely, right? So 100 years ago, they knew pasture was the right thing, but they thought it was nutrition related rather than allergic related. Okay, so no indoor arena, no hay storage, water down the hay. If you can water the hay, then you can feed hay because if it's wet, there will not be any aerosolized. You can feed hay cubes or hay silage or a complete pelleted hay, or you can steam the hay. And I'll show you that in a minute. So complete feeding a complete pelleted feed is a really good option, but it's really expensive. Watering down the hay is a really good option. It's inexpensive. So it depends, you know, if you're boarding the horse, the person who's feeding horses probably doesn't want to do this for you, but they'll do this for you. But if it's your own horse in your own backyard, you'll probably do this and, and not do the pelleted. This is a hay steamer and you can buy them commercially and you can even buy a little one to go on the road with you when you're going to a horse show. And if you steam the hay, uh, you will virtually eliminate the allergic reaction to hay if you can steam it. And these are, you know, these are a, a few hundred dollars, but they're very effective at preventing horses. Now, now let's talk about drugs. We need to use for horses where changing the environment was not enough. They're still having trouble, right? So you can do um, one of two things. You can do two things, really. Um, you need to use steroids to reduce the inflammation. And then you can use a bronchodilator to give some immediate relief. So you've probably all seen um, somebody, maybe you yourself have an inhaler that you use. And sometimes it's a bronchodilator, which gives you this immediate relief, opens up your airways. It doesn't do anything about the underlying disease. Um, but the steroids do. The steroids address the underlying disease. So um, in, for humans, you're probably taking uh, puffing on a steroid morning and night, or maybe just in the morning, and then you're using the bronchodilator as needed. And there are all sorts of options. So we want to reduce the inflammation, and we want to relieve those symptoms of, bron of, of bronchoconstriction. There are lots of options, but the first question you want to ask yourself is, do I want to use a systemic drug? And systemic means the whole body's going to see that drug. So that means you gave it either orally or by an injection. Aerosolized, just the lung is going to see that drug. Does that make sense? So you need to make a decision. Do I want to give the whole body drug or do I just want to give it to the lungs? 
and there are some important decisions to make there. So the advantage of the injectable is usually it's easy to give and it's less expensive. And the problem is you probably don't want the whole body to see steroids. There's a, there's a complication with steroids that is unique to horses and maybe some of you know what it is. If you give injectable steroids to horses, a proportion of them will do something that you cannot reverse. Does anybody know what that complication is? Horses and steroids, uh, horses will founder. And founder is, do you guys know what that is? Yes, no. So founder is uh, a rotation of the hoof and they, it really renders the horse not useful and mo most horses that founder are euthanized. So you don't really want to risk that if you don't have to, but occasionally we do risk that. Not every horse that gets steroids will founder. It's also called laminitis, if that term is more familiar to you, but it's a bad, bad, bad disease. And in the 30 plus years that I've been a veterinarian, we've made no progress in reversing or treating or preventing founder. Uh, it's, it's a bad one. Uh, so that's the concern about systemic steroids is safety. So aerosolized um, is uh, much safer because you're just delivering it to the lung, but it's expensive and it's harder to do and you have to do it more frequently. So if you give a steroid injection, you could give it every other day, but with aerosolized drug, you're probably doing it twice a day, maybe three times a day. And this is a, an inhaler that's been designed for horses. So 20 years ago, this was, uh, part of what I took, uh, I, I worked on this for um, this particular drug company where we tested this in my herd of heavy horses. Is it easy to use? Is it effective? What's the right dose? What's the right, um, what's, what's the right um, interval between treatments? Um, at what point is the dose too high and the rest of the body starting to see the drug? Those are all the questions that we answered um, for the FDA before this could go on the market. So. Here's a, an older prototype and a much younger me. And this is a horse with heat. You can, his name was Scooby-Doo and you can see him breathing hard. This is just at rest. He's done no exercise. And you can see the problem with using aerosolized drug when they're breathing this hard is some of the drugs coming out the other nostril. Some of it's coming out the back of the device. So it's really hard to distribute drug into a lung when a horse has this poor of lung capacity. So this is true in people too. So if you were to go to the emergency room in status asthmaticus, which means you're having a crisis that's this bad, they're gonna give you injectable steroids. They're gonna give you some aerosolized bronchodilators or maybe some injectable bronchodilators. It's just really hard to get drug into the lung. So I want you to look, we're in the lung of an airway. I'm gonna stop for a minute and come back to that. We're, we're in the trachea, right? And there's some mucus here and here's a horse that's breathing hard. And if I deliver the puff early in inhalation, anticipating when inhalation is gonna happen, it's gonna get into the lower airway of this horse. But if I deliver the puff at peak inhalation, I want you to watch what happens. And I think it happens on maybe the, third, the fourth puff. So let's watch. Can you see that puff go by? There's another one. Are you guys, oops, let's go back. Are you guys seeing that puff of drug go by? Can you see it? Yes. So let's, oops, let's watch again. So there's one. There's another puff. There's another puff. One more. Now watch this one closely. Did you see what happened? So when I delivered the drug at peak inhalation, it went down to the bifurcation and then it came back up and none of the drug got in the lung. And so it's really important um, for your owner to know you've got to anticipate that inhalation when you puff that drug into the lung. Otherwise, the drug is not getting where it needs to go. So that this is uh, you know, another piece of 
it's easier to give pills or syrup or a shot than it is to, to do inhalation. There are lots of um, delivery devices for inhaled drugs. Um, this, this mask allows you to connect any inhaler that you might use in human medicine to it and get it to the horse. This one too um, allows you to use any inhaler. Here's another one that's a little smaller. This one's a less expensive, but a little less uh, effective. And you can see, you can use it in dogs, you can use it in cats. We'll deliver antibiotics by inhalation. We can deliver antifungal drugs this way. Uh, it's just a nice way to get some drugs directly where they need to be. And so there are lots of categories of bronchodilating agents. And the one you're probably the most familiar with is albuterol. That's the one that most humans are taking. Sometimes they're taking a combination of ipotropium and albuterol because the duration of drugs and the mechanism of action varies. So this is a long acting, this is short acting, they're different receptors. Together, they result in much better bronchodilation than they would individually. I just want you to notice this category of drugs, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and the one at the back, caffeine. So caffeine is an effective bronchodilator and it also strength, strengthens the muscles of respiration. So you'll see a lot of athlete, athletes taking caffeine before they perform because it really does, it's a legal drug that opens up their airway and strengthens their diaphragm, strengthens the muscles uh, surrounding your ribs to help you breathe better. Um, theophylline is in chocolate. Chocolate is a bronchodilator. Um, and this is another classic class of bronchodilators is aminophilin. So, so there are lots of classes of bronchodilators, but albuterol is probably the drug when somebody has an inhaler that they're using on an emergency basis, it's this drug. It's the most powerful, it's the quickest, um, is albuterol. So there is a drug that is um, marketed for horses that you can give by oral administration. It's a syrup, it's pretty easy to give. Um, it is not very expensive. And uh, the worry is the whole body is seeing this drug and it makes people, people take this drug and it makes you a little bit shaky and um, you can really, you know, increases your heart rate. It opens up your airway, but you've got these other things going on. Um, and so that's, that's, the, that's the disadvantage, but this is a nice drug. Um, the advantage is it's far, of aerosolized drugs, they're far more powerful. So if you're gonna give a bronchodilator, giving it by aerosol is gonna do a much better job. Um, but they're more expensive and they require more frequent administration. This horse is interesting. This is one of the horses in my herd and um, we were giving steroids every day and steroids makes horses more responsive to these drugs. It increases the number of receptors and suddenly they're way more sensitive to these drugs if they've been on a steroid. So this horse has been on a steroid for about a week and we gave the traditional dose of that syrup to this horse. And then I went and looked at another horse and I came back and you can see he is dripping in sweat. The stall looks wet because he's sweating so hard. His normal heart rate in a horse is 40. His heart rate's 100 and his eyes are all dilated and he's all jumpy. And so the point of this study was at what point are steroids in this drug gonna create a toxicity problem for the horse? And the answer is we found it, right? This is the point in which that's an unacceptable level of toxicity because the steroids created an increased sensitivity to this particular drug. It lasted about six hours, it's not great. So what are we gonna do for a horse who's in, um, we don't need the sound on this one. For a horse that's breathing this hard at rest, what are we gonna do, right? You gotta make a decision. You're probably not gonna get very good drug distribution in the lung with an aerosolized steroid. So you're gonna use a systemic and injectable steroid. You're probably gonna to try to use the short acting bronchodilator, so albuterol, and then you're gonna to try to use a longer acting uh, bronchodilator. Maybe the syrup, maybe this ipotropian drug, 
but you want to combine both short and long acting and you're going to keep given like most of the time you're given this drug three times a day i might give it every 15 minutes and just open up the airway a little deeper each time for two hours i'll give it every 15 minutes until that horse is breathing better does that make sense What if they don't respond to therapy? Well, that happens. So that means let's look at the environment again. Maybe maybe there's something wrong. And, and this happened to me with the horse eating out of a round bale, right? I didn't give enough instructions about no round bales, right? I, I've had it happen to me where I took away the hay and changed the stall and horse wasn't getting better. And I went to visit them and they were betting on straw. I didn't talk about the bedding and they were bedded not on straw before they were using shavings, but but I didn't know they switched to, sh to straw and they didn't know it would be a problem. So go back and look at everything again and make sure that there's no source of allergen. And then you need to reassess the diagnosis. That's the point at which I'm gonna take some radiographs of the chest. Maybe it's a pulmonary fibrosis. Maybe it's something else entirely. Some horses are resistant to steroids, not very many. Some horses are so dehydrated that their secretions are really thick and ropey and they can't, they can't get it out of their lower airway. So if you were to um, give them some IV fluids, it would, it would loosen up those secretions and they would do better. Um, sometimes that means IV fluids. And we can also do nebulization with saline. So we, we can, you know, if your mom's ever, if you've been coughing and your mom puts you over, puts a towel over your head and puts you over a hot, steaming either the sink or a pot. Anybody ever do that? Yeah, Martha's the only one. So maybe this is a generational thing, but that is about getting some, getting some steam into your airway so that you'll be able to bring some of that up. So there are lots of inhalers for horses. This is one of them. Um, lots of options for doing this nebulization therapy where you're actually creating steam for that horse to breathe in to help them um, to open up their airways. So if you've got a horse with mild to moderate obstruction, you're probably gonna use aerosolized steroids because it's safer. And you're probably gonna use a long acting bronchodilator. And before you get on that horse's back, you're gonna use some pre-exercise albuterol to open them up immediately. So that horse has a much better time while you're working the horse. So horses that you have had episodes before and you'd like to avoid them, um, it's important that you do that because they develop less permanent damage to their lung. The more time they can spend in remission, the less likely their lungs will be permanently damaged. They progressively improve. And so that, that in that case, you're gonna give very low dose aerosolized steroids to prevent horses from having an episode. Does that make sense? Okay. So we've got a 14 year old pony. She's 10 months pregnant. Can everybody see the pregnancy? It's pretty big, right? She's having a really hard time breathing. Partly because of the pregnancy, partly because she has heaves. And so what are we worried about? If she's not exchanging good air, that baby is not getting good oxygen, right? So we need to take care of her breathing immediately so that that baby continues to get oxygen. When babies don't get good oxygen, they're born and we call them dummy foals. They don't suckle, they don't stand, they don't, and, and they start to fall apart. Foals are really, really fragile. So foals that didn't get good oxygen in utero have a very high risk for dying. So it's really important that we do something to restore oxygen to the baby as soon as we can. So treatment plan. I think the biggest dilemma here is that steroids can cause, uh, so she's 10 months pregnant, um, babies are born at 11 months, okay? So she's got a month to go in her pregnancy and steroids can cause um, early labor, abortion, right? And we don't want that to happen. That's more likely in cattle. You, if you give a, a, a um, pregnant cow one month before she delivers a steroid, she's going to dump that baby out. But horses are not as likely to do that. So you can, for her, 
you were going to prefer to use aerosol steroids because you don't want her to dump that baby early, right? Ideally. You're going to use systemic uh, corticosteroids, meaning injectable, if she's really in trouble and she's probably not going to dump the baby. You're going to use the very rapid acting bronchodilator. You're going to use the oral syrup. And the beauty of the oral syrup is this is clenbuterol is the drug that women get put on at seven months pregnant, right? And they're starting to go into preterm labor. Clenbuterol stops uterine contractions and will help her preserve that pregnancy. The same thing will happen here. Not only is it a bronchodilator, but it will stop those uterine contractions and help her hold that baby longer because the worst uterus is better than the best incubator, right? The worst uterus is better than the best full ICU. So you want her to hold that baby as long as you can and clenbuterol will help you do that. But you have to remember when she's getting ready to deliver, you gotta take her off clenbuterol a couple of days before you think she's gonna go. And you're gonna feed a low residue diet. What do I mean like by that? Well, let's go back to the story from 1903 where they thought hay was bad because it was too much bulk. And in this case, it probably is. So we're gonna feed her a complete pelleted diet that's very um, dense in calories. So she has to eat less. There's less fill in her intestinal tract. She'll have more room for the baby and more room to breathe. So that's the plan for any 10 month old, any term pregnant mare who's having a lot of trouble breathing. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left for questions. Do any of you have questions about this disease or the cases that we talked about? Martha, should I pass out the test now? Is this when I pass out the test? <laughs> That's a great idea. I don't see any questions in chat. Um, if you do have a test, you are welcome to go with it. Nobody else is smiling. I I, <laughs> I don't have a test. I should have done a... Um... Oh, here's a question. Okay. Ethan, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? You've got your question in chat, but if you unmute yourself, everybody could hear the question without having to read it. Okay, no trouble, Ethan. So Ethan's question is, is it hereditary? Somewhat, but it's not like blue eyes and brown hair. It is more complicated than just a simple allele, simple Mendelian genetics, right? It, it's more, there, there are obviously multiple loci affected. And it means that um, if you bred a heavy horse to a heavy horse, you've got about a 44% chance of getting a heavy horse. Um, but, but it's not like it's dominant, recessive, not, not like that. Um, and it's very similar in humans that have asthma. There's, you know, there's normal parents that produce an asthmatic child and there are asthmatic parents who have a child that doesn't have asthma. So it's more complicated than we understand at this stage. Good question, Ethan. Okay, I'm gonna ask anybody who wants to go to vet school, just do the raise your hand function. I just wanna see the raise your hand function on if you would like to go to vet school. Oh, that's great. Yeah, because at this point you may want to, um, you know, put in how you came about to becoming a vet, but that would be great to see how many are actually interested. So go ahead, raise those hands. Okay, it looks like almost everybody. Um, Rachel didn't raise her hand and Martha didn't raise her hand, although I think Martha wants to go to vet school. Um, and so uh, before I talk about how I ended up uh, in veterinary school, oh, Rachel is raising her hand. Rachel, we're taking applications. Well, not quite now, but yeah, we could get you in for an interview probably, Rachel, if you play your cards right. Um, okay, so if you're, um, tell me if you've got questions about vet school. 
application, setting yourself up. Let's let's do that first. If you guys have questions about going to vet school, how to get in, that sort of thing. I don't have a question about vet school, but I do have a question. Have you researched anything about like how to treat the disease like founder or it's not really a disease, but the condition? Yeah, it, it kind of is a disease and, and I have not done founder work myself, but as a profession, um, we've spent millions and millions of dollars trying to figure out how to prevent founder and probably around the time or maybe a little before some of you were born, Barbaro was a horse that broke its leg during a, a high profile race. And we, we were worried, it was a back leg. And so when they, they can founder in two ways, either, either it's a systemic disease, like they're very, very, very sick, or you've given them steroids, or they can have overload founder, which means they've injured one leg and the, the opposite leg that they're putting too much weight on will founder. And so Barbaro's, owners were extraordinarily wealthy people and they dumped about 20 million into laminitis research and it did not translate to any any new prevention treatment i i like in laminitis to people say why can't you fix this horse with laminitis so all the little interdigitations that hold the hoof to the bone have broken They've, they've torn them, there's bleeding, hemorrhage, swelling, edema, all of that. And so the bone has rotated away. And I would liken it to, let's say you're gonna take the windshield of your car and you take a baseball bat to it and it's shattered, right? Now you're asking your mechanic to put that windshield back together and make, it, make you be able to see through it again. That's, that's really what we're asking. And so the best research would be on the prevention. And it's not fair to say we've made no strides. What we do for prevention, when we've got a horse that's very sick, pneumonia, um, post-op colic, something bad, is we will put them in ice boots that go up to their elbow. So we'll put a boot on them up to their elbow and we'll fill it with ice water. It reduces the blood flow to their foot and their leg. And that is probably, it seems like a really simple, low tech thing, but that has been uh, our best defense against those horses developing laminitis. It doesn't work for overload laminitis, which means you've broken this leg and now you're standing on this leg while this leg heals. This one, we, we haven't figured out how to stop that from happening. But for the horses that are very sick, septic, toxic, very ill, um, putting them in ice boots helps. Does it prevent every time? No, but that's probably the only advance we've made in 30 years is that. And, be, and the reason is, is once it happens, it's like putting your windshield back together again and expecting to be able to see through it. And, and you can't, yeah. Uh, okay, so a couple of things here. Courtney asks, how do you go about getting a letter of recommendation from a professor? So I presume, Courtney, that means you're an undergrad and you would like to get a professor to write you a, a letter of recommendation. Well, I think you wanna pick a relevant topic that uh, biology, zoology, animal science, and go talk to the professor and say, I wanna go to vet school. Um, you know, what do you, what do you recommend? Uh, what do you think I should do that would help my application stand out? And the answer usually is research um, it, or work with an, volunteer work. You can help them on a research project. You can help them, you know, taking samples or watching, gathering data or for, organizing data. That sort of thing is something that would be good for you and would help you stand out as a college student. And the, that professor will. Um, that those are gonna be the professors that write the best letters of recommendation for you. Um, you also need a recommendation from a veterinarian. So spending some time with the veterinarian in their practice, ask good questions, 
be interested, know when to be out of the way and not ask questions and know when to when it's okay to ask questions and try to get some good advice. Um, how can someone in high school, what can you do to stand out when applying to vet school based on something you did in high school? Um, I, th I think it's very similar as you're gonna, um, you're gonna go visit a veterinarian. Maybe you're gonna volunteer at a shelter. Maybe um, you're gonna um, um, be, a, you know, being a part of a practice is gonna be really important. Really good grades in science and math all in, and really verbal skills are also very important. So get to be a good writer, get to be good at math, get to be good in science. And those, that's really your most important task in high school. And beyond that, spend some time with a veterinarian and um, high quality experiences with veterinarians, right? And that, that doesn't mean I, I feed dogs on the weekend and I clean kennels. It means maybe you volunteered at a shelter. Maybe you um, volunteered enough that you found yourself um, being a, you know, providing, helping with the adoptions. Um, giving advice at adoption time or, or handing out the adoption materials. Maybe it means um, you're, you impress that veterinarian enough that they're letting you um, do functions that are beyond what a, what a regular observer might do. I think most veterinarians are really generous with their time and they're, um, you know, for high school kids, um, they're, they're probably going to pay you for what it is that you're doing. Um, some will just want, you know, you might start out as a volunteer, but if you're making yourself useful, they're probably gonna pay you. Yeah. How many of you have spent time with a veterinarian already? I see some hands going up, good. Yeah, I think that really that really makes you stand out. Mark, even Martha raised her hand. I've spent some time with a veterinarian as well. Okay. Good. Are there any other questions about going to vet school, getting in, things that are important? Th things that are important that will, I should talk about early admission. Has somebody already talked about early admission, Rachel, already to them? No, Martha says no. Okay. So if you get a 29 on your ACT or higher, um, you are eligible for the early admission program. And we used to wait till you got to K-State to admit you into the early admission program, but the timeline is different now. And I think the deadline is February 1st this year. So if you're a senior in high school and you've got a 29 on your ACT, go to our website, read about early admission and, and send your application in. We'll do interviews, Rachel, in the spring, is that right? So that you can know- Yes, they are in the spring, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. So that you can know before you make the decision about coming to K-State because we, we um, you know, some people came to K-State thinking they would make the early admission cut and then they didn't and they were very disappointed. So we want students to know before they make their final college decision about whether they're in the early admission program or not. And then from there, there it gives you really access to the school, to the college that you wouldn't normally, the access to the vet school that you wouldn't normally have um, you'll have a mentor, there'll be um, events that happen periodically, um, you'll have a mentor that's a, a student that was also, that's in vet school, that was an early admission student before, and um, it's a, it, and then when it comes time to go to vet school, you don't have to go through um, the admissions process, you don't have to do the interview, if you have met all of the requirements of the program, um, then you're automatically admitted to vet school. So every year um, we have about 10 or 12 students who come to vet school who were admitted from high school, met all the requirements and skipped over the application process um, that everybody else goes through. So to give you some perspective, we have 1600 applications, this 1680, 1680 applications this year. About 150 of those will be from the state of Kansas. And we're gonna take 120 students. So it is, it is very competitive. And uh, so if you can do early admission, that's a, it's a huge leg up, right? 
Any other questions about the process? So, Dr. Rush, to be uh, respectful of your time, it's 4.35, okay. and you have been very generous with speaking with us about this important topic. Um, it's amazing, uh, amazing that research still needs to be done. So future vet school students, think about that as a topic of research. It could be valuable for many species, not just the horses. So um, thank you again, Dr. Rush. Any last minute questions from students? We are pretty easy to find, Rachel and I. Uh, if you have questions about application, tours, you can write to me. I'm probably gonna forward it to them, but certainly you know how it, where you're easy, easy to find. So you want a tour, you want to, um, you know, talk to somebody about what it means to get in. Um, that's what we're here for. And the admissions office would love to talk to you about uh, going to vet school. And if it's in, if anybody is kind of piquing your interest on other topics, if you go back to that uh, website where you, uh, at K-State Olathe, where you registered, you can see an entire archive of topics that were covered. So maybe that would also help you with e-hours with, um, with your classes. So hope that's helpful. Feel free to email me if you've got any questions. I'm going to put my email contact, even though it was already on the uh, invitation and reminders, I'm going to put that in the chat. Feel free to contact me at any time. And thank you again, Dr. Rush. This has been very informative. Great to see you all. Good luck. You know how to find us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.